Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. And Perrin is my co-host today. And who do we got here, Perrin? We got probably one of the best keyboardists of our generation. The one, the only, Derek Sherinian. What's going on, Derek? How are you doing, guys? Thank you for having me on. Yep. I mean, exciting news. Uh, new solo album, The Phoenix, on Inside Out Music. The release date is Friday, September 18th. And the last solo album was, what, nine, eight, nine years ago, Derek? Yeah. Um, I took a little time off, and then in 2016, I, I formed Sons of Apollo with Mike Portnoy, so most of my riffs and musical or creativity was going towards that. And I just felt a real urge last year to start doing a solo record so i went and got a new deal and called up simon phillips and we got to work about 18 months ago we started writing the phoenix and uh here we are it's coming out in a couple weeks and we're very happy with the result and we're getting amazing worldwide response for the phoenix so far why don't you tell us a bit about the record i i was just saying kind of offline that uh, Inside Out, your record label, was nice enough to give us uh, some advanced files yesterday. And, mm -hmm. you know, we get a few of these. And I have to say, this is like the most interesting thing that I've listened to uh, in the last little while. Uh, I really felt it was a really diverse record. You know, a little bit of Boogie Woogie, a little bit of your prog influences, a little bit of Sons and Apollo and Dream Theater, maybe, uh, a little bit of jazz, a little bit of metal. So, you know, what, what goes through your mind and what inspires you when you're putting something like The Phoenix together? Basically, The Phoenix is a snapshot of my life for the last 18 months. And, you know, I go through different moods and styles. And, and that usually comes out in the, the writing. And I think that there's a lot of variance in the songwriting, as you said, on this record. But what's really cool is that it's a cohesive recording in that Simon and I are the common denominator. So we're the, the thread that goes through it but we picked the right bass players and guitar players according to the compositions. And I think that's part of the artistry is, is being like a casting director and choosing the, the perfect player to uh, convey the, the musical idea the best in the song. And I think we nailed it all throughout this record. You got Zach Wilde, you got Billy Sheehan, you have uh... Steve Vai. So how is it? I mean, are you, are you planning this beforehand? You're saying, you know, this sounds like Steve Vai. Steve would be perfect for this song or, or, or maybe you're working on material over the years together. How did you put all the pieces together with these names? Like what is Steve Vai to you? And what is, what is, what goes through your brain when you're saying I need Steve Vai on this song? Well, the one song that Steve plays on is called Clouds of Ganymede. And I wrote that all myself and it's very, uh, influenced by UK Alan Holdsworth and today Steve Vai is the guy that plays that legato style for the melodies that, that I wrote you know he was the only voice that I heard for it you know if Alan Holdsworth was alive I'd have him play it but Vai is the next thing and uh, I developed a relationship I've known him a long time like the last 20 years but in 2017, he invited me to tour on the Generation X Asia tour, where I was the keyboard player for he, Zach, Ingve, Nuno, and, and Tosin Abasi. And so Steve and I became closer during that. And when I told him that I was doing a solo record and invited him to play, he gladly accepted. And I think he did a great job. I'm really happy to uh, have Steve Vai on one of my records. Derek, since we're, you know, we're a bit of a metal show and uh, Judas Priest is a favorite on the metal voice, you have Simon Phillips on the record and Simon Phillips seems to, have, is your constant through the record. And I think he's been a constant through a lot of your records. Uh, yes. your solo records. So what is it about working with Simon that is just, you know, whereas for other instruments, you want to have, you know, guests coming in and out, but why is Simon uh, the go-to drummer for you? He just, to me, is the best. He's, earned, he's my favorite drummer out there, and he has been for the last 40 years. The first time I heard Simon was in 1980. Two of the records that I used to play all the time was Jeff Beck, There and Back, and also MSG1. 
and Simon was the drummer on both of those records and they came out about two months apart. And what struck me was how great the drum sounded, but I was blown away that it was the same guy on both records and that he had such an identifiable style on the drums. And that had a huge impact on me as much as when I heard Eddie Van Halen in 1978 about having a signature style on your instrument and being able to play and different styles, yet no matter what style you play, your personality is so strong on your instrument that people can identify you. And that's basically, if you look at my career, the last 30 years, I've gone from everyone from Dream Theater to Alice Cooper to Joe Bonamassa to Billy Idol to Ingve, all completely different styles, but the very best at what they do. And I'm able to navigate effortlessly through all of those genres, yet still sound like Derek Sherinian wherever I go. All right, so Pasadelo. Pasadelo, how do you pronounce that? Pasad Pasadelo. Pes Pes Pesadelo, which is uh, nightmare in Portuguese. All right, so is this a flamenco, Brazilian flamenco? What is that? What's that style that's going on there? I guess it's a, uh, yeah, Brazilian flamenco. I don't know that flamenco is, I think that's more Spanish, know. but maybe it's a flamenco with a Brazilian twist. <laughs> I guess. Nevertheless, Kiko is amazing. I've known him a long time, but this is our first collaboration. And he, uh, we wrote this song together. He came over to the studio a couple days and we, we put this together and I love it. I think it is a great way to close the record. It's probably the heaviest thing on my record. And, and I really love the flamenco bit in the middle. And yeah. it's a nice change of pace and it's unexpected. Yeah, I wrote in my notes, it was definitely like the most metallic song on the record. And I think it was a really good, you know, good exclamation point on the record. And, you know, Kiko being in Megadeth now and having been uh, in Angra is definitely kind of like, you know, again, someone who's really on the radar of everybody in the metal. Yeah, team. and he's fantastic. And what a great fan base he has. He really has a whole country behind him. And um, I'm really hoping a lot of his fans become my fans after hearing this song. Yeah. And was there anybody on this album that you wanted that you didn't get? Um, yes. Yeah, Steve Lukather. Van Halen. Well, always, you know, <laughs> but I, I didn't approach him, but Steve Lukather, I invited and he would have loved to have played, but he's just super busy this, this time, but he assured me the next record he'll play. And, and that's pretty much it. Everyone else, we figured it out. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with the turnout. There, there's a track, Empyrean Sky, that I, I felt was kind of, you know, maybe if you were showing nods to your predecessors, you know, to the John Lords, to maybe the Rick Waitmans, the Keith Emersons, that's the track. You know, in my notes, I put it was like a prog lover's delight is what I wrote for uh, Empyrean Yeah, there's some prog in there. It's, it's kind of hard rock. And there's also a uh, Return to Forever jazz fusion. 70s influence so it has a little bit of everything in it i like the temple of helios where is that uh, greek island yeah, cool <laughs> uh, i think the helios i think was the island that the the bird the phoenix was killed at oh okay i think i, I looked that up and when i was looking for song titles i was looking for uh for titles that would be related to the phoenix and i found that so i actually know what that is derek you know not too long ago Actually, it was the last live show I was at. Uh, Jimmy and I got to see you of Sons of Apollo uh, here in Montreal. And, you know, when everything shut down in March, I was kind of bummed because, you know, you guys were getting such amazing buzz. The tour, the show here in Montreal was sold out and crowd was going nuts for you guys. And I had heard that all of the dates on the tour were going really well. And then you guys went to Europe and it seems the record was doing really well. And then obviously things came to a halt. So... You know, what's going to happen in the new year in terms of starting up the machine? You want to support your solo record, but there's probably still some miles left in, in Sons and their last record, uh, 2020. Uh, or is there more Sons of Apollo on the way? So just how, how are you going to kind of balance, you know, doing your due diligence with your solo record and career, but also maybe, you know, doing, doing right by Sons of Apollo? Yeah, well, first and foremost, we have Sons of Apollo dates rescheduled for May 2021 for Europe. Mm -hmm. And then we also have South American dates in April. 
So fingers crossed that we're able to honor these dates and, and go play and get back to normal. Uh, it really does feel like there's unfinished business for the 2020 record. I mean, we only played three weeks worth of shows. The show here was great and really great. You guys had a great reception. Thank you. And it's fresh. It, thank you. And as you said, you know, there was a nice buzz and the momentum was building. Business was up at, across the board. And we felt like, all right, this is fucking killer. The band is great. I mean, you see the dance, like the Power Rangers up there. Every guy has its own, his own uh, deal happening. And so, um, yeah, it just sucked that we had to cut it short when we did. And a lot of this downtime with so many bands that we're talking to now, you know, they're going, you know what, I'm gonna, we're going to record another album. We'll just keep it in the can. Or another album. I know there's just so many bands with so much free time because of COVID-19. Has Sons of Apollo started sort of bouncing ideas around for the next album? Well, I mean, I, I write every day and Ron writes every day. And all I know is I just keep stockpiling ideas. And then I decide later whether I'm going to put it for a solo record or Sons of Apollo. It always kind of works itself out. So right now I'm just really, now that the Phoenix is done and I'm just doing press, I'm just really practicing on my instrument and trying to stretch my hands in new directions and stockpile new ideas. And I find that when I go into my studio with the mentality of practicing and, and experimenting rather than writing, the, there's less pressure and more creativity flows out of it. And so I'll, I'll just let the, the tape player roll and I'll just play and let my hands go. And then I'll go back and listen later and see if I can find any nuggets out of it, you know? It was so cool. So, so Derek, you, I mean, you've been lucky enough to kind of, I mean, anyone who's new to Derek watching this show, just take a look at your resume. I mean, I've personally, in 1990, I saw you on the trash tour of Alice Cooper. I remember seeing you as part of Dream Theater on that tour of Deep Purple and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Uh, when I lived in San Francisco, I saw you play at the Warfield of Billy Idol. Wow. Uh, and we saw Sun. He's been, he's been following you all around. <laughs> yeah, well, it's amazing. I, I'm a music lover, and I've, I've seen you play in so many different bands, uh, which is why I'm glad to be here today. Uh, oh, that's amazing. What have you learned yeah. from just, you know, playing with this who's who? Like, is, are, there, are there any, you know, stories or moments you take away, whether it's from Alice or whether it's, you know, being on tour of Dream Theater, Deep Purple, ELP, or from Billy? I mean, uh <laughs> Everything kind of goes into your life toolbox, I guess, and your music. Yeah, ab absolutely. You take the good, and I mean, all of the people that you mentioned are at the top of their game for a reason, and there's greatness there. And so when I'm playing with these people, no matter who they are, I just try to absorb as much as I can and learn and try, how can this apply to what I'm doing? And then I also, conversely, will see the mistakes made business-wise or or yeah. creatively or, or whatever, you know? And so I take it all in and, you know, over 30 years of doing this stuff, it just, you, you find that the, there's always going to be issues that you're dealing with, but you just get a little bit smoother at it as time goes. And you want to get to a point where you're self-sufficient enough that you can generate your own business without having to worry about touring or, playing in a band like it's been very difficult since uh, all the tours were canceled and a lot of musicians are going how in the hell am I going to make a living during this I can't go play shows what am I going to do and I've been very fortunate because I've always have done keyboard sessions on the side for unknown artists and famous artists like for instance I just played on Michael Schenker's new yeah. 50th anniversary record a couple weeks ago and then I played on a couple White Snake albums for uh, uh, David Coverdale last year, which wow. are now appearing on all of the um, the rock album. And then there's going to be a ballad album and a blues album. I'm on all of that. And so I do a lot of keyboard sessions for uh, famous artists and up and coming and new artists, guitar, solo artists and bands as well. All over the world, people are hiring me to play on their records. And it's a great, this, what's been a little side business all these years has turned into you know, a full on yeah. business. So I'm doing that and simultaneously finishing my solo record, working with Simon and doing other sessions and 
and promoting the Phoenix doing press like this. So every day is action packed, but yeah, the session business has been amazing. And I've been really uh, getting to hear and play on a lot of great up and coming new artists from all over the world. And it's very gratifying for me to contribute to their sound and see how happy they are afterwards. And then they release it with me, special guest Derek Sherinian, and they're getting new fans that they normally wouldn't have had because a lot of my fans want to be completists and have, you know, copies of everything that I play on. So it's all good, man. I love it. So Michael Schenker, I saw the press release a few weeks back or maybe a month ago. Uh, what type of song is it that you're you're guesting on? Is it uh, is it a re-recording of a classic or a brand new track? It's a br it's a brand new song. I'm not sure who the singer was on it, but Brian Tishy's on on drums, and it yeah, sounded I great. I mean, it sounds like a classic Michael Shanker song. But what really turned out, which I'm really happy about, is I he wanted me to play solos, and he oh. gave me like two different solo spots to play. So I did my my thing. And he was so happy with, with how it turned out that his, uh, his manager or lawyer, whoever it was, wrote me back saying how happy Michael was and uh, he wants to do more stuff in the future. Oh. And then this, they're saying like, well, how much do we owe you? And I said, listen, I don't want to be paid to play with the great Michael Shanker. It's my honor. And I said, <laughs> if he wants to return the favor and play on my next solo record, that would be awesome. And so they immediately wrote back saying, Michael would love to do it. Just send us the track. So me being me, I immediately wrote like the killer ultimate Michael Shanker track, which is like, like a new into the arena 40 years later. Wow. But I had Simon Phillips play drums on it. And Tony Franklin's already recorded the bass. And so I've sent it off to Germany. And so I'm waiting for Michael to lay his tracks. And this will be for my next solo record. So it'll just be sitting in the can. So for, wait, uh, wait a, a second. Year. So this is the new, new solo record. <laughs> yeah, this is number nine that hasn't been released yet that I'm uh, writing yeah. right now. You don't know about, like, you know, <laughs> if there's a second wave, there will be another Derek Sheridan solo record. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm utilizing a third, the actually. If I, if I can't tour, I'm in the studio. <laughs> uh, Good on you for not, you know, I guess when Michael Schenker says, sure, I'd like to play on your record, you kind of jump on that. So. You write an album. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Well, yeah, I wanted to take advantage of it while it was fresh on his mind. All right. So someone, a, a band like Kiss, what do you, what do you learn backstage from Kiss? So, oh yeah, you were the keyboardist. Was it, um, uh, what tour was it? Uh, it was Revenge 92. Revenge, that's it, that's it, that's it. You're backstage with them. What have you learned from them, the do's and the don'ts, like you said? I mean, this is like a huge organization here. It's huge, you know, and it was a great experience watching how Gene and Paul ran their business and the crew and, and just the whole mechanisms of a huge rock band like that going on tour. There's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot to learn. And so I kept my eyes open and knew that one day I'd have my own band like Sons of Apollo and all the things that I learned from touring with Alice Cooper Kiss and Billy Idol, I'm learning on their dime. Yeah. And so I can apply it all to my deal later on. Yeah, any, any stories about like, I, you know, I, I've seen you in kind of, uh, you know, more of some metal settings, but Billy Idol is not quite, you know, metal, he's rock. What was it like yeah. working with Billy? And because you worked with Billy for quite a while, I believe. Yeah, 12 years uh, for like pretty much Every summer, wow. most of the summers I'd go out and, and play. It was great. He was a very cool boss. And it was restricting for me playing wise, just going out there and playing the hits. Yeah, it's straightforward, I would say. And, right? uh, mm -hmm. Say it again. It's pretty straightforward, uh, I guess, that material. Yeah, think. all night. And, and it's all based around, you know, backing Billy up and Steve Stevens, who's fantastic and has played on a couple of my solo records as well. Um, yeah, Billy was cool, but it's a pop scene. And, you know, it's, for, for someone like me, it gets old fast. And after 12 years, I was just, I was done. All right. So here's the last question. Uh, I was at uh, Kathy Rose's winery in Burbank. I did, a, I did a piece with her there. I mean, I've met, I went to Missoni. I did a piece there. And they, they just mentioned your name out of the blue. They go, Derek, sure, Indian's always around here. I mean, what's your... You're, you're, what did Randy Rhodes mean to you as a keyboardist? Uh, or, and oh, well, how has he influenced you? 
He was a very huge influence. Like when I was 15 or 16, when the Blizzard of Oz record came out, I immediately gravitated to Randy Rhodes. At the time, I was only listening to Eddie Van Halen. And then all of a sudden, Randy came up. And I was like, oh, what? there's someone new that's really, you know, cool. And I got into his playing really deep. And I related to him because I could hear the classical influence. And at the time, I was studying Bach on uh, uh, piano. And like I saw the relationship yeah. and the benefits of learning classical because Randy was doing it and he applied it to rock. And when he died, it was, it was very devastating for me at the time. I remember I was a junior in high school and I remember wearing a black armband around my arm out of, out of you know, to honor Randy. And it was, it was very sad because he was a hero to me and it was just so sudden, all of a sudden it was, it was gone. And so I've always been a huge Randy Rhodes fan. There's a big, uh, there's a lot of Randy DNA in my keyboard style and in, in the solos. At times it really comes out for sure. But over the years I've developed uh, a friendship with the Rhodes, the siblings, Kelly and, and Kathy. And, um, you know, they're great people. And I've played at the Randy birthday celebrations diary of a madman with a string section i did a orchestra an orchestration at for, winery, right? for at strings winery. yeah it's on youtube if you search but it's for diary of a madman and uh no it's really great randy rhodes was awesome what a, what I, did, a talent. I, I did a report on rand on kathy and kelly and musonia you check that out it's got a lot of hits it's oh, okay. uh, it, was, it was a great piece that i did i just basically went into the whole family but it was not only about randy it was about the Rhodes family so yeah um, great people great folk and oh yeah fantastic yeah. Uh, do you have any last questions Perrin? yeah well just derek maybe you just last word about the phoenix what would you want the metal voice fans to know about the phoenix the phoenix is the guitar not only is it the keyboard record every year that's a given <laughs> it's the guitar record of the year. It's the guitar record of the year, okay. and the best guitar talent in the world is on this record. For blues, I got Joe Bonamassa. No one plays blues better than Joe right now. I have Zach on guitar for the metal. I have Vi, and then Bumblefoot is the the sickest shredder yeah. out there right now. It's just absolutely playing stuff that no one can even touch. He's playing double neck. Uh, fretless guitar and he's just getting sounds that others aren't even coming close to and Kiko is, is fantastic and then I have all the great bass players Billy Sheehan Tony Franklin and then Simon Phillips on drums it doesn't get any better than that so if you're into great instrumental music great production uh, you have to get the Phoenix there it is Derek Sherinian the Phoenix inside out music release date September 18th 2020 Available on all platforms, I assume? Yes, all uh, worldwide, all platforms. And proclaim the greatest album of 2020 right here yeah. and now. Thank you. Is this self-proclaimed right. self -proclaimed or did you proclaim it? I proclaimed it and so did you. So yeah. it's a all mutual right, proclamation. I, and I, I love it. Mutual <laughs> proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, Derek, Good day with time, you guys. Man. Have a great day. Be safe, all right? Thank all you, right. Derek. Thank Take you very care. much. Take care. Bye-bye.